Hello, I'm James Oliver. I'm the head of the ophthalmology unit at Dick White Referrals in the United Kingdom, one of the biggest private referral practices here. And today I'm going to be talking about keratoconjunctivitis sicca, more commonly known as dry eye in the dog, its diagnosis, causes and treatment. So in terms of talk plan, I'm going to give a little bit of introduction first, some definitions and talk about the tear film and the lacrimal system, which are important when we think about dry eye. I'm then going to go on to talk about the clinical size of dry eye, its diagnosis, which is not quite as simple as the Schirmer tear test, the main cause of dry eye and the treatment, concentrating on medical aspects. So first of all, a bit of introduction about dry eye. So the tear film is the watery layer which covers and coats the ocular surface, the cornea and the conjunctiva. And this is essential for optimum, optimal ocular surface health. And dry eye or KCS is any deficiency in the quantity and or the quality of this tear film. As any deficiency in the tear film will lead to a reduction in the health of the surface of the eye. And we'll see several negative side effects of this. So we may see signs of ocular surface inflammation and pigmentation, which can cause visual deficits. We can see corneal ulcers develop, which are very painful. And if severe can lead to the need for surgery and possibly even the loss of an eye. Ocular surface infections are common, both conjunctivitis and in association with corneal ulcers. And dry eye in itself is a very painful condition, so there are significant welfare implications of this disease. So on to the tear film. The tear film is broadly thought to be divided into three layers, so it's trilaminar in its structure. The outer layer is a lipid fatty layer, and it's thought that this layer stabilizes the tear film and prevents evaporation of it. We then have an, a middle aqueous layer, which occupies about 90% of the tear film. And it is this layer which is arguably most important as it nourishes and protects the ocular surface. Finally, we have the innermost layer, which is the mucin layer. And this is responsible for adhering and diffusing the tear film. And this is closely intermingled with the corneal epithelial cells. And the tear film is derived from the lacrimal system, which has two components. So firstly, we have the secretory component, which is responsible for production of the tear film, and various glands and cells are responsible for its production. So firstly, we have the lacrimal gland, which is perhaps the, uh, which is the most important gland uh, in the tear film production. This is situated in the orbit of the eye, and it contributes about 70% of the aqueous layer of the tear film. We then have the nictitans gland or the gland of the third eyelid, and this also contributes significantly to the aqueous layer, contributing 30% of the tear film. And because this um, contribution to the tear film is so important, this is why it is advised against removal of the prolapsed nictitans glands, so-called cherry eye, as such removal can lead to an increased risk and development of KCS in later life. We then have the goblet cells. Now these are distributed fairly evenly across the conjunctiva of the, of the eye, and these produce mucus. So they, they contribute to the, that inner layer of the tear film, which adheres and sticks and spreads the tear film across the ocular surface. And then distributed across the eyelid margins, we have the myobomian glands, and these produce the lipid layer, the outer layer of the tear film, which stabilizes it and prevents evaporation. The second component of the lacrimal system is the excretory component. And this is arguably um, much less important when we talk about dry eye, but it's important to understand it. So this is composed of the openings to the tear duct system, the lacrimal puncta, which feed into the um, dorsal and ventral canaliculi, which then feed into a rudimental lacrimal sac and the nasal lacrimal duct, which then in the nasal ostium or punctum. So this diagram illustrates that. So on the left, we have the excretory components of the lacrimal puncta, dorsal and ventral, which feed into the respective canaliculi, which in turn feed into the rudimentary lacrimal sac and nasal lacrimal duct, which ends in the nasal punctum or ostium. On the right-hand side, we can see the lacrimal gland, which is located in the dorsolateral orbit. And this distributes its tears via several lacrimal ducts into the dorsal conjunctival fornix. The goblet cells are distributed in the entire conjunctival surface, which produce the mucin, and the myobomian glands are present along the eyelid margins, which produce the lipid. 
So now onto the clinical signs of dry eye. Well, these do vary depending on several factors, but in particular time since the onset of the problem and also the extent of the dryness itself. Common early signs, which may be also associated with transient dry eye and mild dry eye, are reddening of the ocular surface, so conjunctival hyperemia, and, and an intermittent mucoid to mucopurulent discharge, particularly if there is a secondary bacterial infection. More chronic signs will see a lacklustrous cornea, and the discharge can become persistent and tenacious, and often is mucopurulent. With chronic corneal drying, we'll see chronic corneal side effects such as corneal vascularization, pigmentation, and also fibrosis, which leads to significant visual deficits if severe. So as we can see, there are numerous, numerous possible ocular surface signs, and so it's really, really important that dry eye is ruled out in all dogs with ocular surface disease, i.e. a bare minimum, a Schirmer tear test should be performed in all dogs with evidence of ocular surface disease if it's safe to do so. So a few photographs to illustrate some of these clinical signs. So this dog here, we can see has a mucopurulent discharge, which is caking the periocular area. We can see medially and laterally the, the conjunctival redness or hyperemia. There is corneal vascularization and the cornea has a very lacklustrous appearance. As we can see by the lack of a sharp camera uh, flash image uh, reflex in the center. Here we have another eye with chronic dry eye here, so we can see corneal pigmentation and further vascularization dorsally, and as a mucoid discharge ventrally. So what other clinical signs can we see? Well, corneal ulcers are particularly common, and these can sometimes mask um, dry eye because when you have a corneal ulcer, the, the ulcer is painful and you get an upregulation of tears. So it's very important that even if there uh, is not a diagnostic schematitis reading in the presence of corneal ulceration, that this is re repeated later in life uh, when, when the corneal ulcer has fully healed. Now, corneal ulcers can occur at any stage of dry eye and can be very rapidly progressing uh, and become complicated and so-called melting. And if this happens, they can progress to perforation of the globe, which obviously puts the globe at being risk of being lost entirely. Secondary, usually to corneal ulceration, we'll see uveitis. So this occurs via stimulation of the trigeminal nerve endings, which feed back into the ciliary body to cause various effects such as meiosis, release of proteins inside the eye, and in severe situations, release of pus inside the eye, known as hypopion. If discharge is profuse, we may see dermatological signs, so blepharitis, inflammation of the eyelids, along with periocular dermatitis. And particularly with neurogenic dry eye, in cases where Sherman tear test readings are nil, so there's zero tear production, the nostril on the affected side can appear extremely dry. So some more photographs to illustrate some of these um, signs. So I think we can both see here that there are two very severe corneal ulcers. Dorsal left, we'll see a smaller ulcer, which is approximately mid-stromal in depth. And to the right, a much larger and deeper ulcer, which is approximating to decimus membrane. So this eye is at risk of perforation. There is dorsal corneal vascularization. There is conjunctivitis. And the white material that we can see ventrally is actually pus inside the anterior chamber. So this eye has an intense uveitis with secondary hypopian. Another case, a more chronic dry eye in this situation, as demonstrated by the pronounced corneal pigmentation. And ventrally, we'll just see a plug of what appears to be pussy mucousy uh, discharge, which is at the site of a ruptured corneal ulcer. The green stain is fluorescy. Another ruptured corneal ulcer, so dorsally we can see corneal vascularization, then a very large corneal ulcer, which at its ventral aspect has now perforated and the resultant defect is being plugged by iris tissue and clotted aqueous humour. In this eye, which has been cleaned for the benefit of the photograph, there is a central deep corneal ulcer, which probably requires surgery. We can see extensive corneal vascularization, and those corneal vessels has, have hemorrhaged in various places, leading to intrastromal hemorrhages and clots surrounding the corneal ulcer. 
So now on to diagnosis of dry eye. Now we're probably all familiar with the Schirmer-Tier test, but did we know there are actually two Schirmer-Tier tests? Normally when we talk about the Schirmer test, we're actually talking about the Schirmer-Tier test one. And it is this that is performed without prior application of topical anaesthetic. And this is what we'll nearly always be doing and talking about in dry eye. So this type of Schirmer tier test tests for an aqueous tier deficiency. So it's a quantitative um, test rather than a qualitative test. And there are other types of diagnostic methods used to assess qu um, qualitative deficiencies. And the Schirmer tier test one, as opposed to the Schirmer tier test two, assesses both the basal and the reflex tear production. So the basal tear production is that low grade constant turnover tear production, uh, which is at a constant rate in normal situations. Whereas a reflex tear production is what occurs when there is a noxious, noxious stimulus to the corneal surface. So if something nasty pokes in the eye and stimulates the trigeminal nerve endings, which then feed back to the lacrimal glands, which then induce uh, increased production of tears. Normal production is 15 millimeters per minute or greater. 11 to 14 would be typical of early or subclinical uh, dry eye. 6 to 10 millimeters per minute would be diagnostic of a mild to moderate dry eye. And less than 5 millimeters per minute would be indicative of severe dry eye. But of course, these results should always be interpreted in conjunction with clinical signs and also any other patient factors which come into play. For example, is the dog otherwise ill, which could explain a transient reduction in tear production, or is it receiving any medications which could be reducing tear production? For example, has it received any sedatives or had a recent anaesthetic? So just for completeness and not because I think you'll be doing this very regularly in general practice, but the Schirmer tear test two is what is performed following the application of local anaesthetic. And it might be that actually you've accidentally placed a drop of anaesthetic without thinking and then still need to do a dry eye measurement and therefore you are limited to just performing this. So because this numbs the ocular surface, it is numbing the trigeminal nerve endings and therefore it does not assess the reflex component of the tear production, but only the basal tear secretion. So as I said, it's performed after the application of topical anaesthetic and the topical anaesthetic of choice in small animal ophthalmology is proximeticane, which you can get in these uh, handy uh, single-use minims uh, um, vials. It is very rapid in onset um, within a minute and will last up to 20 minutes and it's minimally irritating the ocular surface. So after applying um, the anaesthetic, you wait one minute, then you gently dry the lower conjunctival sac using swabs or cellulose tip spears. And then you perform your Schirmer tear test as normal. And the readings are approximately 50% of the Schirmer tear test one. So a normal reading would be around about seven and a half millimeters per minute or above. So how should we correctly perform the Schirmer tear test? So the Schirmer tear test one, as I mentioned, should be performed before application of anesthetic, but also before application of any other drops or excessive examination of the eye, which could artificially uh, raise tear production by irritation. It's very important to avoid touching the notched ends of these strips because any grease on your fingers will inhibit tear flow up the paper strips. So it's best to fold uh, these strips at the notch while still in the little plastic envelope. Then the paper strips, which are labeled left and right, L and R in the photo, are inserted under the lower lid at the lateral third of the lower eyelid. And it's important that you place it here to avoid uh, the third eyelid getting in the way and to ensure the paper strip is in direct contact with the cornea and therefore stimulating those trigeminal nerve endings. So this is the correct placement of the Schirmer test strip. So as we can see, um, the notched end uh, has been folded uh, and that proximal end of the strip is just tucked under the lower eyelid at its lateral aspect and it is in exact contact with the cornea and the third eyelid is well out of the way. Fluorescein staining should be performed in uh, all cases of ocular surface disease including dry eye and also in, in monitoring of dry eye. As we know the most common indication of the use of fluorescein is in the aid of visualization of corneal ulcers but it also has other applications such as in 
assessing aqueous humor leakage if there is a concern about perforation of the eye and also in performing what's known as the tear film breakup tie, which we'll talk about very shortly. My top tip for fluorescein applications to avoid the use of those drops um, in vials, as these can be very messy to use and get all over your hands and the work surfaces. Uh, instead, I prefer these um, fluorescein impregnated paper strips, which come in these little sterile uh, wrappers. You just need to uh, moisten the end of the strip before direct application to the dorsal bulb or contractiva. And then you allow a blink to occur before irrigating any excess fluorescein away with some sterile saline. And then ideally you would view the eye, the cornea and the, and the, and the rest of the ocular surface, the conjunctiva, through a cobalt filter which excites the fluorescein. But you'll be able to do a, a decent job also by using just white light as well. So I, I just mentioned the tear film breakup time and this is also another application of the use of fluorescein. And we actually use this to assess the qualitative tear film deficiencies. So deficiencies where we're not uh, concerned that the aqueous component of the tear film is deficient, but the outer and inner layers of that trilaminar tear film may be missing. So the lipid and the mucin layers. One drop of fluorescein is applied to the surface by, via our paper strip. We then enforce a blink to, to ensure even distribution of fluorescein over the cornea. And then we hold the eyelids open and examine the tear film under magnification and preferably cobalt blue light, but white light if you don't have it. And what we're looking for uh, are dark spots to appear in that green coating of fluorescein on the ocular surface. And we measure the time until these dark spots occur. And the normal break of time should be uh, at least 15 seconds, up to around 25 seconds, and anything under 15 seconds would be suggested of a qualitative tear film. Some other diagnostics which you may want to uh, perform from time to time are cytology and culture of the ocular surface, particularly indicated if there's continued mucopolent discharge or if you've perhaps treated a supposed uh, uh, infection topically but the discharge has not resolved. If there's a complicated corneal ulcer, so a melting or malacia corneal ulcer, if there's evidence of corneal infiltration, so evidence of abscessation or white blood cell uh, that's being uh, distributed within the corneal stroma, and also if there's local skin infections, blepharitis and dermatitis. Cytological samples should be performed after application of proximetocaine, so our anaesthetic agent of choice. So the, the drop is applied to the eye, you wait one minute, and then you take your sample. And to get the most diagnostic sample, it's best to use a cyter brush, but if this is not available, then the blunt end of a scalpeler can be used as well before spreading the material onto your slide, and then um, either sending off for examination or in-house um, staining with a diff quick type stain and examination under the microscope. Some other possible investigations might be performed more rarely will depend on the history uh, of the dog um, and the suspected cause uh, and any other clinical signs which might be going on. So obviously we'd want to do a physical examination in all our patients, which might lead us down a particular line of inquiry about a possible cause for dry eye. Diagnostic imaging may be considered in case of neurogenic dry eye, tra trauma, or if we think there perhaps is a neoplasm somewhere um, responsible for the dry eye. Now, dogs with endocrinopathies are known to be at higher risk of lower tear production and dry eye, so endocrinological testing might come into play. And finally, very, very rarely, DNA testing can play a part in etiological diagnosis. So now on to the common causes of dry eye in the dog. So we can see drug-related causes of dry eye, and this can be either as a result of the use of sedatives and anaesthetic agents, which is the most common, uh, which is probably the most common cause of transient reductions in tear production, but also we can see toxic effects of the use of drugs systemically, which can cause pronounced keratoconjunctivitis sicker. Some dogs can be born uh, with dry eye, and these are particularly uh, in certain breeds, they're breed related and can have inherited components. Neurogenic dry eyes are a fairly common cause of dry eye. 
But the most common cause of dry is immune mediated or idiopathic, when there is a destruction of the lacrimal tissue by an immune mediated mechanism. And there are, all, there are other more rare causes of dry eye, such as trauma, neoplasia, infection, and endocrinopathies. So on to the drug-induced dry eyes, first of all. So sedatives and anaesthetic agents, first of all. So nearly all sedatives and anaesthetic agents are known to reduce tear production for up to 24 hours and perhaps even slightly longer. And the systemic and topically applied anticholinergics in particular, for example, atropine, can really profoundly reduce tear production for, for an extended duration. So the take home message is really that ocular lubrication is essential for all patients undergoing any form of sedation and anesthesia. And this should be started at the time of application of an administration of these medications and also extended for at least two days, 48 hours in susceptible animals, in particular those brachycephalics, which are at higher risk of corneal ulceration. So there are also toxic effects of drugs that can occur. So certain drugs can cause a toxic lacrimal adenitis. There can be a very sudden uh, and often uh, severe and permanent uh, dry eye. So sulfonamides are the, mo are, the most, uh, sorry, are the most known culprits for this. They tend to be associated with an acute onset and dry eye, which can be extremely severe and, and permanent as the gland atrophies. There is a non steroidal anti-inflammatory drug called etodolac, which has also been associated with dry eye systemically. Um, and I don't think this drug is widely used in the UK, but it may well be used in, in other countries. So uh, these, uh, this knowledge really underlies the importance of uh, Sherman tear test monitoring and monitoring for clinical signs of dry for all dogs undergoing treatment with any of these drugs. So on to the congenital dry eyes now. So first of all, certain breeds uh, can be born with an, an absence of lacrimal tissue, so, so congenital A lacrima. Uh, in the UK, the most commonly uh, breeds associated with this are the Yorkshire Terrier and the Chinese Crested Terrier breeds. But also we see a congenital dry eye in the Cavalier King Charles Spaniel, uh, particularly in the United Kingdom. And this is a uh, syndrome associated with ichthyosiform dermatosis, dermatosis, which is a, a kind of dry, curly coat, uh, which leads to the uh, term dry eye and curly coat syndrome, which is commonly used by Cavalier King Charles Spaniel breeders. And this is a genetic defect. So congenital A as I mentioned, is um, most common in the Chinese Crested and the Yorkshire Terrier. And these photos here are of Chinese Crested Terriers. So these guys tend to have a very profound dry eye, which require very frequent lubrication to reduce secondary uh, side effects of dry, such as coin ulceration and to maintain comfort. And parotid duct transposition, um, so surgical treatment, is often considered fairly early on for these guys. In the Cavalier King Charles Spaniel with dry eye and curly coat or congenital ichthyosiform dermatosis, this is seen as an autosomal recessive disease. And what we mean by that is the affected dog needs to have two copies of the bad gene uh, to be affected by the disease. So in this situation, the gene in question is FAM83H. The mutation is known, a DNA test is available from the Animal Health Trust in the United Kingdom, perhaps other providers as well, which may be uh, used in cases of, uh, of dry eye in this breed and would give you an etiological diagnosis if the, if the DNA test was confirmed as the dog having two copies of the mutation. Similar to the other congenital dry eyes, these patients require very frequent tear replacement therapy. Lacrimal stimulants, so cyclosporin and tacrolimus, have been tried in these guys, but response is variable uh, and often not significant. So uh, a more common cause of dry eye is neurogenic dry eye. So the, the lacrimal gland, which produces the, uh, the majority of, of the tear film, the aqueous component of the tear film, 70%, if we remember, is innervated uh, by parasympathetic nerve fibers. So we need to know a little bit about the course and formation of these fibers to truly understand uh, how neurogenic dry can occur. So these parasympathetic nerve fibers originate back in the brainstem in the facial nucleus. 
and they follow a very complicated course in reaching the lacrimal gland. So they first run with the facial nerve via the internal acoustic meatus and the facial canal. Then they synapse in the pterygopalatine fossa, and then they join a branch of the trigeminal nerve before finally branching off to reach the lacrimal gland. So a very, very complicated course. Now, why am I telling you all, all of that? Well, mainly not because you need to remember it, but just because a lesion at any type, uh, any location uh, uh, of any type along this pathway can lead to neurogenic dry eye. And the inciting cause could be an idiopathic one, an inflammatory one, a trauma, or even neoplasia. So there can be several potential causes of neurogenic KCS. Depending on the exact cause and the location of that, uh, of that defect, other neurological deficits may be present. So in preganglionic lesions, for example, with a lesion um, which was, it was associated with otitis media and interna, we may see signs of facial nerve paralysis, Horner's syndrome, vestibular signs, and commonly a dry ipsilateral nerus, as can be seen in the photograph here. And in postganglionic lesions, we can see periocular anesthesia. So it's really worth looking out for these other signs. So as well as performing a normal eye examination and, and physical examination, uh, it's worth thinking about the neuroophthalmic examination and how it relates to dry in a little bit more detail. So, uh, even though we don't really realise that when we're performing the Schirmer tear test, we are actually testing some of these nervous functions. So when we are performing the Schirmer tear test 1 and Schirmer tear test 2, we're also assessing the function of the lacrimal nerve. And when we're performing the Schirmer tear test 1, we're also assessing the trigeminal nerve. Remember, this is the sensory, these are the sensory nerve endings. Uh, which are knocked out following application of local anaesthetic. So we're not assessing this in the Schirmer tear test too. When we perform the corneal reflex and the palpebral reflex, we're also assessing the, the branch of the, of the facial, uh, of the, sorry, of the trigeminal nerve. And in the corneal, palpebral and dazzle reflexes, we are testing the, the efferent component of the reflex arc of the facial nerve. Sympathetic signs may be present in, in animals with Horner syndrome, so meiosis, the eye protrusion, uh, ptosis, so drooping of the lower eyelid, and enophthalmos. And our physical examination should include an oral examination in case there is evidence of otitis media, which may be present, although it may not always be. And as I mentioned before, further diagnostics may be required, for example, uh, CT and, and MRI in localising the the lesion in question. Finally, neurogenic dry eye can be associated with hypothyroidism as a peripheral neuropathy, so total T4 and thyroid stimulating hormone testing should be considered in these cases. Now, on to immune-mediated dry eye, which, as I said before, is the most common cause of dry that we'll be dealing with in practice. Usually, this form of dry is associated with a gradual onset in clinical signs. But not always, sometimes the presentation can be quite acute in nature. So in this situation, there is a T-cell mediated destruction of the acina tissue of the lacrimal gland. There is a breed disposition, so um, in the UK in particular, and, and elsewhere I am sure, um, this disease occurs most commonly in Bulldog, with Highland White Terriers, Cocker Spaniels, and so on. And immune media dry is more common in dogs with endocrinopathy. So those dogs with diabetes mellitus, Cushing's disease and hypothyroidism appear to be at higher risk of immune mediated KCA. So now finally on to treatment options for dry eye. And I'm actually going to concentrate on the medical options rather than um, surgical options. So I'm first going to talk about tear substitutes, otherwise known as lacrimomimetics. We'll briefly talk about antibiotics, which will be used topically in certain situations. Pilocarpine can be used both orally and topically in the treatment of neurogenic dry eye. And calcineurin inhibitors are most important in immune-mediated dry eye. And so we'll be talking about cyclosporin and tacrolimus. But when all medical treatment options fail, we may consider a surgical option, parotid duct transposition. Now, it is beyond the scope of this talk to talk about this in detail, but 
very briefly the theory behind protic duct transposition is translocation of the protic duct, which uh, uh, normally secretes its saliva into the mouth um, dorsally near the carnassial tooth. When we perform a, a protic duct transposition, which we only perform as a last resort when all medical options have been explored and failed, we dissect this duct free and transpose it under the skin and subcutaneous tissues up to the conjunctival fornix where it is there sutured in place. And from then on, the eye is bathed in saliva as opposed to tears, which uh, will help many cases of dry eye. Although these guys still need frequent medications and side effects and complications from this treatment are fairly common. So on to the medical therapy now. So tear substitutes, otherwise known as lacquer and mimetics. What are the considerations we come into play? Well, we need to consider whether we're dealing with a qualitative or a quantitative tear film disorder. If it's a quantitative one, are you missing the aqueous component? How severe is the disorder, i.e. what is our show of tear test reading? If it is qualitative, so we're missing the lipid and mucin layers of the tear film, which tear components do we think need replacing? Often it will be both. What is the desired retention time of our tear substitutes? And what can the owners manage? What is, what is actually realistically achievable? And are there any potential side effects, such as the effects of preservatives within a tear substitute? So we might consider using preservative-free um, um, lacrimometics, or can potentially the tear substitute itself cause a blurring of vision, which is commonly seen in ointment preparations. So what are the main classes of lacrimometics or tear substitutes? Well, we have the aqueous tear substitutes, and these don't ha have a great use in treatment of dry eye in our patients because they require such frequent application to be useful. So every one to two hours and very few owners uh, can manage this. But this can be useful in-house compounding of drugs which aren't commercially available. So we usually, uh, instead of these, we'll be using a combined aqueous and mucinomimetic agent. For example, carbamine 980, also known as polyacrylic acid. So this is what is in Viscotees and Lubathar, which are the trade names in the United Kingdom, other ones will be available elsewhere. And these are really useful for routine use in, in most cases dry eye and should be applied depending on the extent of the problem around every four hours. So on to some of the other classes. So we have the lipid based ones and these usually um, contain a combination of three ingredients paraffin, mineral oil, and petrolatum. Lacrolube is the most commonly used one, but Vite Pos is useful, particularly when lacrolube is commercially unavailable, which is uh, sometimes the case. Because these are an ointment base, they have a longer corneal retention time. So you can get away with applying these less frequently, so perhaps every six to eight hours. One of the side effects of these, because it's an ointment base, they can get, cause blurring of vision. So many will advocate using these last thing at night to reduce the interference of vision. In recent years, viscoastics have become very popular in the treatment of dry eye, and the most commonly used one is sodium hyaluronate, and there are various products on the market. Um, my preferred one is Hyabac. Uh, this has a good retention effect on vision, and there is some evidence that they can actually help corneal healing, corneal healing so maybe useful in, in coil ulceration. And preservative-free uh, products are available. Application is usually every four to six hours. So you can get a, away with slightly less frequent application than the combined aqueous mucin components, such as uh, carbon 980. So on to antibiotics, so we would want to use these if there was evidence of secondary bacterial infections, which are very common in dry eye. Now these can be minimized and managed often just by regular cleaning of discharge with sterile saline. And it's always worth advising owners to do this if there is discharge, but, and doing this before the application of medication, otherwise all that discharge and gloop in the eye is just gonna uh, interfere with the action of the drug you're applying, and that drug is gonna be wasted. First line treatments, um, we'd be thinking about fusidic acid, which you can get away with twice a day, uh, or chloramphenicol four times daily. 
And we use these as first line because um, we are really thinking about a bacteriostatic effect of the drugs, which, which these are, and also because of our knowledge of the normal ocular surface uh, commensal flora, which is predominantly gram positive. And both these agents have good gram positive efficacy. If you have poor response to treatment, or if there was a really uh, severe infection to start with, or a nasty uh, corneal ulcer, if perhaps it was melting, you'd want to do cytology and culture and sensitivity to uh, have evidence-based selection of antibiotic therapy. Now on to treatment uh, for neurogenic dry eye. Now these guys have typically nil tear production, so a schematitis production of zero, and so require very frequent tear replacement therapy. In cases when I suspect there is a neurogenic dry eye, I still like to trial them with an immunomodulator. And so I'll try these with 0.2% cyclosporine, otherwise known as Optimune, to start with, because under the cascade, this is in the United Kingdom, this is the only authorized um, treatment for dry eye. And I've been caught out before, and I've seen cases which I've thought have been dry eye, which have been responders to immunomodulators. And so I always like to use these to start off with. For non-responders, however, and when the diagnosis of, of neurogenic dry eye is as certain as it can be, then pilocarpine can be considered. And pilocarpine is used in a couple of different ways, and we're using the ophthalmic drop formulation. Now, this drug is a direct-acting parasympathomimetic, and it is used to treat parasympathetic denervation of the lacrimal glands. But for it to work, it has to there has to be some functional glandular tissue still present. And so if, if the dry has been going on for many, many, many months, that may not be the case, and cases may not respond to this. So we can use this drug either orally, even though it's not found in the product. And when we use it orally, we're usually using a 2% pilocarpine hydrochloride product. And the advised dose rate is one drop per 10 kilos of body weight per os per day. And it is advised that this is increased perhaps on a weekly basis until signs of toxicity are observed, for example, vomiting, diarrhea, inappetence, hypersalivation, and even cardiac arrhythmias, which is pretty scary stuff. It is then reported in the textbooks, at least, um, the dose reverted to the previously highest tolerated dose, i.e. that dose which causes uh, an improvement in tear production, but without those nasty clinical signs. But it must be um, borne in mind that there is a publication out there uh, and a various clinical and anecdotal evidence which suggests that 50% 50 50 of cases of neurogenic dry, dry may spontaneously just heal on their own, which may allow withdrawal of oral pilocarpine uh, over time. Thus, if you were to start a dog on this, if, this medication, it doesn't necessarily need to be on it and at risk of these side effects for life. Some ophthalmologists also advocate topical pilocarpine. Now, I've not had much success with this, uh, but topical uh, pilocarpine can be compounded in-house um, using hypromellose, which we mentioned before as an aqueous tear substitute, and a concentration of 0.1 to 0.25% has been advocated, and this is usually applied twice daily to the eye. Now, in many cases which are refractory to treatment, and this applies not only to neurogenic dry eye, but any cause of dry eye, parotid duct transition uh, needs to be uh, considered. So now on to the treatment of immune-mediated dry eye, which will be the most common uh, 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 cases that we'll be treating in practice, both in the first opinion and the referral setting. So when we're talking about immune-mediated uh, uh, dry eye treatment, usually we're talking about the use of some kind of immunomodulator and the calcineurin inhibitor class of immunomodulators. Now this includes cyclosporin and tacrolimus and also pemacrolimus. Now, these agents, depending on which we're talking about, are derived from natural sources, so fungi and bacteria, and they work by inhibiting T cell activation and proliferation by working in the T cell itself. And by doing that, they inhibit T cell mediated destruction of the lacrimal, of the lacrimal tissue. There's also evidence that they can have a direct lacrimostimulant effect by other means and can have other beneficial effects in terms of ocular surface health. And so we'll often use these not only in dry eye, but treatment of corneal inflammation and corneal pigmentation. So in general, there are some operating warnings when we talk about the use of uh, 
um, calcineur inhibitors. Whenever we prescribe these, we should be having a chat with the owner and giving them um, informed information and informed consent about the use of these drugs. So these drugs shouldn't be used in pregnant animals and there should be operator warnings. So the, the user should wear gloves, avoid contact with skin, wash hands, uh, and, uh, and pregnant people should be advised against handling these medications. And as I mentioned, consent should always be used, uh, should, also be, should always be sought uh, and gained whenever any unauthorized medication is being used in the country in question. So in the UK, cyclosporin is the only authorized medication for canine dry eye. It's available as a 0.2% ointment in Optimune. And it is the mainstay of treatment for the vast majority of dogs with KCS. Lifelong treatment is needed, and treatment is most effective when it is started early. It's been shown that animals with nil tear production, which may have no functional lacrimal tissue left, are at a higher chance of not responding to this medication. So this is why it's really important to pick up on those very early signs of dry eye, pick up on it soon, and implement therapy quickly. Now there can be a lag of effect of treatment with this, so it can start working fairly quickly within two weeks, but can take up to eight weeks to, to have maximum effect. So it's worth um, just being patient with this before uh, giving up. And obviously, as I mentioned, operator war. Now, in some situations, animals might not respond to the 0.2% satisfactorily, so we may consider um, compounding higher concentrations. And we can do this in-house using corn oil, which has been shown to be quite kind to the eye in an off-label setting. But these high concentrations can be very irritating to the eye, and it's something that I don't do these days. Episcleral implants have, have been reported uh, for treatment of dry eye, in particular for those dogs which aren't amenable to topical therapy. And we all have these patients on our books. So these implants are these little um, white things. There's one here in the bottom right uh, screen. They're about two centimeters long and they contain about 12 milligrams of cyclosporin. They are implanted uh, subconjunctively in the episcleral location. So these are some photos from the publication by Barraghetti uh, et al. Uh, in Vet Ophthalmology 2019, showing what response you can get. So this case was considered as likely to be uh, a poor responder to treatment for dry eye, and it was a non-amenable to topical therapy. So in the top left image, we can see uh, the eye before the implant. So we have chemosis, so a con swollen conjunctiva, conjunctival hyperemia, there's discharge, there's corneal edema and fibrosis and vascularization. And then we will see uh, moving round uh, gradual reduction in clinical signs. So top right, 30 days afterwards, um, the conjunctiva is less swollen, the cornea looks a bit happy. After 60 days, uh, um, the conjunctiva is much less swollen, le less red, and the cornea is further clearing. And after 90 days, we've got a real uh, uh, obvious uh, and, and significant difference compared to the before implant photograph. So it looks like this could be a very, very uh, um, helpful treatment uh, for dry eye. But we don't really know how long these implants last. It's likely that they'll need replacing at least every year or so. So what other option do we have if um, cyclosporin 0.2% uh, doesn't work? Well, tacrolimus is what my go-to, and that's what I would use if Optimune doesn't work. Um, so uh, um, this drug is 100 times more potent than cyclosporin. So that's why uh, often uh, animals which don't respond to Optimune will respond to this. It's uh, used topically usually as a 0.02% ophthalmic formulation. And I'd always prefer an ophthalmic form formulation. Uh, and in, uh, in the United Kingdom, this is now fortunately av available from Bova UK, whereas before when I wanted to use this drug, I had to import it under uh, um, special treatment certificates, which was a big hassle. And then we got caught in customs, which caused really big delays to the patient. Tacrolimus is also available as dermatological preparations in this country, 0.03% and 0.1%. Uh, but the excipients in uh, these can be irritating to the eye and ophthalmic uses advised against. But if you were to use this for whatever reason, then the 0.03% would be the uh, one to choose as it would be most appropriate and 0.1% would be rather overkill for the disease. In so I prefer the ophthalmic uh, uh, formulation, which is a 0.02% solution. 
especially formulated for the eye. Uh, and so I, uh, I use the Bova product. It has no preservatives. And it's um, been made by dissolving the tacrolimus in corn oil, which we know uh, is non-irritating to the eye in general terms. And there are no irritating excipients in the formulation. Side effects are really quite uncommon. Uh, and the risks and the handling instructions, the operator war uh, warnings are the same as for cyclosporin. So, you know, wearing gloves and shouldn't be handled by pregnant people and those which are immunocompromised. I like the Bova product, which we can get now. It's a 50 ml bottle, so that lasts um, around 75 days. And so, uh, although the initial outlay lay, uh, is there, it does last a long time. So over time, it pays itself back. And the Bova product has got this really sort of fancy dropper and it has this um, sterile dropper design with this internal airflow technology, which allows for the product to remain sterile without the use of preservatives. And I think we've just got a, a little video here if we can get it to play, which um, will just illustrate that. Which I thought I'd share with you. Is it playing? No, it's, no it is. So this dropper has been designed to be the size which is appropriate for the dog eye and opening up it actually contains this complicated mechanism which uh, has a filter uh, and um, the drop is, is applied which uh, takes a bit longer than other dropper bottles. If there's any excess you just gently wipe that away and as the, after the dropper is applied the air flows back into the device through a sterile uh, uh, filter ensuring sterility of, of the product. So that about uh, wraps up the talk. So I'm just going to have a uh, give a few um, concluding remarks. So dry is a common and a clinically important disease in dogs. Inadequate treatment of this disease can lead to pain, blindness, and even loss of the eyes. So it's really important that it's treated appropriately uh, and effectively. Now, all dogs with signs of ocular surface disease should have a Shermer tear test one performed. Most cases of dry in the dog are immunomediated. We've talked about various lacrimal mimetics, so tear substitutes, and the new game player is sodium hyaluronate, which is a very useful tear substitute, and so is appropriate for use in all cases of dry eye, really. I would advise trying 0.2% cyclosporine in all cases of dry eye, just in case it's a missed diagnosis, and also there are other beneficial effects of immunomodulators other than just improving tear production. But for non-responders, I would use 0.02% tacrolimus. And I prefer the Bova product as it's preservative free uh, ophthalmic formulation. And also it has a sterile dropper design, which means it lasts for a long time and works out as being quite affordable to the client. Thank you for your time.